who am I? Big thing for people once their families grow up and leave or their relationships end or their careers or job, that particular role or job ends, the question is, who am I? We're so immured with these they're not externals, but they are external to the essence of you. So they define us. I think I use them as signifiers. I am a mother. I am a manager. I am a police person. I am a wife. I'm a partner. I'm a... All of these things which relate to a role or a function. Today's guest is my dear friend Sylvie Hussan, transformational coach, working with women who are post 55, approaching higher 60s, and trying to navigate their steps as they embark on their journey at this stage of their lives. A very exciting time in a woman's life, but can be daunting too. Sylvie helps them harness their potential and takes first steps with confidence and courage with them. Welcome, Sylvie. Oh, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you for inviting me to this show. You're most welcome. What is one of the most courageous things you have done? Oh, courage. It's such it's such a loaded word, actually, isn't it? Courage. What's courage? Mm, definitely. Um, I think some of the big stuff you just deal with, which, which require courage, which is divorce and, and your, um, uh, you know, the, the repossessions and all of those things. But I think the most courageous thing I did was being knocked down metaphorically in my late 50s. My relationship went, I was threatened with redundancy. I had, I wanted to just fall and fall and fall and never get up. And the most courageous thing I think I did was to get up. I thought, if I mm -hmm. fall, I will never get up because I don't have anything to drag me up. When that sort of thing happens in your earlier years, there's a lot to get you back up. It's your children, it's your mm -hmm. future, it's, it's all sorts of things that get you back on your feet. I had none of those. My daughter was independent. I was, you know, in my late 50s, 58, I think I was, when all of this, you know, you, your mm -hmm. life sort of implode, explodes into your face, but you implode inwards. And it's it would be very easy for me to just think and say, well, that's it. That's it. I'm just, I'm just not uh -huh. doing it anymore. I'm not playing this game. And, you know, I had this breakdown almost this breakdown in a shopping mall in mm -hmm. Watford, which is not a glamorous place to have a breakdown. And I thought, if I fall down Bless. now, and I thought physically fall, I could physically fall or break down into tears or whatever, that will be the end. I just won't get up again. And I didn't. I sort of stopped all the negative thoughts, just filled my head with anything I could remember off by heart, whether it was nursery rhymes, poems, it's prayers, the Lord's Prayer, anything I could think of that stopped me falling. And then I went out and shopped. That was it. That's what you do when you're threatened with redundancy. Just go out and buy clothes. So that's what I did. But without <laughs> judgment, I thought, I'm going to try things on and I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with me. I'm too short, I'm too fat, or I've got a big ass, whatever. I'm not saying that. It, the fault lies in the cut of the cloth not in Absolutely. the cut of my limbs. And I just thought that was something I think we should all learn, frankly speaking. I think we all need to learn that. But that was just a determ that that was a sort of um, a new principle I adopted on that day, that it's not me, it's them. <laughs> and it sort of stood me in good stead all this time. But that was, I think that took courage from me. I had to go plumb yeah. quite deep in that short space of time. I can totally understand that. And yeah. Wow. And that was really brave of you as well. And I love your analogy of it's the way the cloth is cut. Yeah. Isn't it always, though? It's never cut rightly. <laughs> It is, it is, and we blame ourselves or, or criticise mm. ourselves. And, you know, there must be 
a billion and one women in the world, if not more, with short legs. It's not just mm-hmm. you. And nobody yes. cuts their cloth or their trousers <laughs> for short for short legs. And there's nothing wrong with short legs. Short legs exactly. are good. You know, they get you from A to B. Um, but no, you're made to feel as though you're some sort of pariah if you're if you've got short legs. So is that what took you on your journey to start your coaching it, women? It did was you, indeed. Was it, your it was experiences. The start because I did okay. reach out. As I said, I was threatened with redundancy. I thought, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. You know, what do I train as? If I lose my job, who am I? That was a big okay. thing, and I think that's a big thing for people. Once their families grow up and leave or their relationships end, or their careers or job, that particular role or job ends, the question Mm. is, who am I? We're so immured with these. They're not externals, but they are external to the essence of you. (laughs) Um, So they, they... they define us. I think I use them as signifiers. I am a mother. I am a manager. I am a police person. I am a wife. I'm a partner. I'm a, you know, all of these things which relate to a role or a function that has suppressed. I think that's perhaps um, it, it can be misconstrued. But anyway, we do suppress who we are. And then in after a while, there's so much on top of that, that that, that who we are becomes incrustated with all of this um, externals. And it's trying to it's trying to chip away at those externals to get back mm-hmm. to you, to the heart of you. And I, I, I obviously hadn't thought about it quite in those terms, but I did need help. I needed help to um, to ratify myself. And to a bit of help career wise, and what do I do next? And actually taking action, you know, actually doing something and having a coach mm-hmm. actually helped me with that. I mean, I wasn't jumping off mm-hmm. cliffs or anything or bungee jumping, but I was taking steps to mm-hmm. actually change things or to find out things or to you know or or to explore more um and to know things are possible i think quite often we live in this very limited view of the world which becomes smaller and smaller and we think oh i couldn't do that or that's just not me or and and there becomes almost self-fulfilling prophecies and we don't look beyond Mm -hmm. those it's like a horse with blinkers on you don't realize that there is a world a world of possibilities and your potential is endless unbounded Mm. um and it's 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 from going from limited and fixed to growth and when you're at some stage in your life it isn't a criticism at all of people who who've got a fixed mindset because i know i needed to have that while my daughter was growing up i needed to be Mm -hmm. fixed i needed to be i did it doesn't apply to everybody but there's a point in your Mm -hmm. life when you just need to cut the crap sit still ride something out but then that becomes habitual that limitation becomes almost habitual you've limited yourself and when she was long grown up and Mm -hmm. and and perfectly able but i still had that in my head or i've got to be around in case and you just don't yes. realise that that in case doesn't actually exist anymore. It is yours. That time, this life, mm-hmm. this future is yours. And that can be that can be daunting because you Definitely. all, all, all the understand. other structures that, that have kept you on the straight and narrow have gone. <laughs> so, you know, you can go and get as drunk and debauched as you like, and really nobody <laughs> nobody would care. Not that yes. I did that. And the but, thing is, it's <laughs> almost like. You've got all these labels, it's your identity, and when that's all stripped back, who are you? It's back to the core of who are we? It's like starting again. It is starting. It is starting. And, you know, it's it's starting again. It's starting Mm. with, as I said, with excitement now, because it is all, it's everything to play for now, and not that much to lose, actually, you know, when you're 18. Absolutely. All of this life in front of you, I could do this, I could do that, I could go traveling, Mm. university, or I could just move in with my boyfriend. You've got all of these choices and all of life in front of you. We're at that point again. You know, we're at Mm. that point where we don't 
we, we've got all these choices. I can carry on in this career. I can have another one. I can mm. move. I can, you know, with a laptop lifestyle, we can be anywhere. And we've got all this Absolutely. freedom washing about. But all we let it do is lap at our ankles and then go back back again. Whereas what we need to do is to at least start to wade out and paddle a bit in the freedom. That's our first step, I think. Yeah. I know you're very passionate about society changing their perception of age maturing. Take the fear and stigma away from words like retirement, pension. Tell me more about this. <laughs> As soon as, you, as soon as you say the word pension, what comes to mind is mm -hmm. pensioner, and then you have old age pensioner, and OAP, okay. and the figures. I don't know whether they are now, but it always used to be people who are double bent with a walking stick, with the very long coats. You know, they, they look like people have come out of or retired from Coronation Street in the early days okay. and 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 that sort of sticks old bird dear mm. oh you know and 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 women aren't women particularly i think for men it's never been quite as as defined as that you know you mm -hmm, come to mm -hmm. the end of your useful life whereas for women it feels with those words it feels as though the portcullis has come down on their lives. I'm a pensioner, I'm old, I am retired. And all of those words and, and that perception of you, and I've realised that since I've sort of stopped dyeing my, my hair particularly, that your the perception changes as you approach mm -hmm. people. They, they assume that either you're hard of hearing or you're, you're, you're not quite, Come, or you need to be patronised. I think that's it. There's there's a patronage about it. Yes. Um, and I remember going to the doctors actually, um, to the nurse, and I, I'm always complaining about something. I always got something to moan about. But I said, look, I don't think yes. this is quite right. And you know, how do I put in a complaint? And she actually said to me, well, there's. I said, are there any forms at reception? No, it's online. Do you know how to use a computer? And I said, <laughs> I used to train Oops. in IT. So, yes, I think I have a fair idea of how a computer works. But these assumptions, but anybody yeah, under yes. the, of, you know, in, in the 70s sort of age bracket, 70, 75, 80, mm -hmm. well, if they've been at work in whatever field, they would have used computers, whether you're at a till or whether you're in an office, whatever you're doing, computers were yeah. introduced in commonplace from 80s onwards and it was just mm -hmm. that that complete disconnect between this woman her date of birth and what she is and isn't expected to know and it was just mm -hmm. the assumption because I was in the older age bracket I might not know how to use a computer and it bypassed everything she did know and that comes from just being not thinking and it's the same yes. you know with with generally but generally we have to work now the the pension age now is 67 mm -hmm. so you have to work until you're 67 so for people who are menopausal post the menopausal any organization has still got 10 or 15 years of this person's experience mm -hmm. and skills that they need to harness and not just send them out to grass and you know it's their <laughs> loss Definitely. if they don't because these people are economically mm -hmm. active they have huge huge levels of experience huge numbers of skills mm, definitely. and and all of those if they don't harness them and garner them they've lost them they've lost mm. that that huge resource um and it, it it's a it's at their cost. So I just feel that for all round, we need to change what we're doing. And if you look at people, you know, very much in the 
public eye. You look at, you know, in show business, you've got yes. people like Joanna Lumley. Uh-huh. On the political stage, whatever your political um, allegiances are, but you've still got Theresa May is still very active. You've got Hillary Clinton at the other end, or, you know, on, mm. on the other side of the pond, you've got uh, Christine Lagarde, who's who's in the um, in the EU economics thing, and you've got Ursula, Ursula, who is everybody's crush, <laughs> Ursula von Leyen, I think. I've, I can't, I've never used her own name. But, you know, she's in her 70s. She's mm-hmm. had six or seven children. She is a gynecologist. She is, you know, she's mm-hmm. active and vibrant. And mm. we, we, we all are. As you, but you've touched on it earlier with diet, with health, with everything else. Yes. That, that's the only provisio that you keep healthy. I think that's the only thing we probably need to take more care of that now than we did earlier on. That's, that's, that's the only caveat. Absolutely. And we can all take steps towards that because even I say, I don't want to live a long life. If I'm not active, if I'm not able to do things, Absolutely. I can totally understand that. So, yes, I am passionate about that. It is the patronage because you've got to remember at my age and the many we've had to deal with, it was women at one time. You know, I applied at 18 or 19 before I went to university for the British Bank of the Middle East. They were doing okay. um, management programs or management intake for people with just mm-hmm. eight levels. So I applied to them and they wrote back and said, sorry, it's not our... No, we just don't employ the women into these roles. And that was it. They They didn't have... A reason they didn't have mm-hmm. under such and such act. Mm-hmm. It was just no, because you're a woman, mm-hmm. and we had to tackle mm-hmm. that. There were things you couldn't do. There was very much not a glass ceiling, a bloody mm-hmm. steel ceiling. Nobody expected <laughs> a woman to be doing anything mm-hmm. other than being at home or mm-hmm. you know just not in responsible jobs. Then. Mm-hmm. People of Mm. colour as well. There was a huge thing about that. Again, people sort of used to think, Mm. do you speak English almost, you know? And you think, well, yes, I do, actually. But it was that. So you had to traverse all of those societal prejudices. And people have come through, you know, with education, with legislation, Mm -hmm. with, you know, with with a general global change. Um, And now I think age is the next thing that we have to tackle. Yeah. Um, in terms mm-hmm. of people's perceptions, we have to knock those. People may not know you have a stammer. Tell oh. me how you have managed and coped with that. Oh, thank, thank you for asking that. I, I have just mentioned it, you know, before we came on this so that you were aware. Um, I developed it for, well, I've had it for as long as I can remember. Um, Mm -hmm. And it impacts you at school, obviously. You aren't asked Mm -hmm. to read. You aren't asked to go on to, you know, stage plays or take part in anything. So it sets you aside to some extent. Mm -hmm. And obviously, as you get older, you know, you've adapted and you've adjusted yourself. Um, You adjust Mm -hmm. your speech. And I think what... (laughs) And you 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 adjust your speech. You manage it somehow. You are mine isn't okay. severe, as you said. People don't always mm-hmm. know, um, but they. I think when I first started to manage it, people thought that I was hesitant or nervous because it wasn't mm. so pronounced that you know I it was it was really bad. But it was enough for people to notice. So you don't have to be nervous about it. And I thought, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I just can't get the words out of it. Just leave me alone for a bit. And yes. then and then, with some breathing techniques, with posture, mm-hmm. and with... Um, but it's managing people's, again, like everything, managing people's mm-hmm. perception of you. That if you have a stammer, mm-hmm. you're nervous or you're not very confident or you know all of those things whereas you wouldn't say that about somebody with a northern accent you know it's it's the same as an accent it's 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 the way you speak full stop people might find it irritating and want to finish your sentences and I think well no I don't correct you when you have a bottle stop leave leave me and my speech alone um but it has mm-hmm. it has caused difficulties there are times when 
when I was much younger, I just wouldn't go into places where I had to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, And even when they introduced, you know, say yes or no, have you got the tickets? Have you done this? Yes or no. And I find that even now difficult because I, I stumble on the why, yes, and they say, sorry, we didn't get that. And I think, oh, sod off. I really can't be bothered with this now. I'll try, <laughs> I'll try getting you some, you know, in some other way. Mm-hmm. Um, but when people mm-hmm. set that up, they hadn't taken people with stammers into account. I'm sure, you know, they Absolutely, just didn't. And yes. I kept bringing yeah. it up in our organization that, that, you know, the speech recognition just isn't suitable for everybody. And then there was something called a lie detector where where they, they put something in. I worked in housing benefits. It wasn't a lie detector, but um, that they, they monitored the speech patterns of people to assess okay. whether or not they were, they were, I think it was to assess whether or not they were comfortable and confident in what they were saying. And I thought, again, mm-hmm. I would probably be deemed a liar because I'm I, the voice <laughs> won't pick up the fact that it's a stammer it'll yes. pick up the fact that it's a hesitancy um, and so I mm-hmm. think I think there's that sort of thing that that does impact us and I think mm-hmm. it's like a hidden it, it isn't a disability it's a perception and and the way mm-hmm. society goes or is adapted would make it a di- disability I think and there isn't an yeah, awareness and it makes- yeah, yeah. you make some really good points there. Hadn't thought mm. about that. Oh, definitely. Thank you. But I think, I think, but but it's all these things. It's small, small things that people don't mm. notice, but it's a mm. big thing for the person who's mm. got it. And during the um, mask thing, when we all had masks, mm-hmm. if mm. you're struggling normally, people can see you're trying to do something. You yes. know, you're trying to say something. You might be a bit hesitant, but you're 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 there. A noise is coming out. Um, and your mouth is shaping into something. Whereas behind a mask, it's either just a sound that gets muffled in the mask and they can't see that you're struggling. They just think you're wasting time or you you yes. don't know what you're saying or something else. You, you, you know, they, they don't take stammers into account. And I think that should be something that's included on any equal opportunities training or what we have at the moment because Definitely. i think i yes. think it's more common than we th- know the awareness mm-hmm. came there was a program um about teachers i think or um in mm-hmm. bradford and there was this young boy musharraf and his teacher got him through um something i can't remember which exam it was it was an oral exam and he had to recite mm-hmm. something and the teacher got him through and that was the first i think public awareness of stammering and his was much worse than mine is now but mm-hmm. it was it was a fabulous program and then of course we had the king's speech with um yes with uh, yeah like colin firth and i think that was when mm-hmm. i sort of felt quite protective of my <laughs> stammer i thought everybody's gonna want one now but it's mine you know like the only <laughs> game in the village it's mine i have to be the only one with a stammer mm-hmm. that i know mm-hmm joking mm. apart though but that was um that brought a, mm. a lot of awareness that was quite sensitively done as to how hard yes. it is for an individual mm-hmm. to speak and you're not ne- necessarily not a confident person absolutely not mm. but but having that sets you saps your confidence yes in definitely. In, in, definitely. in a way that yeah. that that wouldn't yes. be it wouldn't normally be sapped by that, by your speech. You'd still be able to speak up in school, answer the questions, you know, do do all of this, take part in in the plays. You know, I was left pulling the curtains or in the chorus at the back. <laughs> so I was never on stage. And I think I'm a bit of a show off. The older I get, the more I realise I am a closet <laughs> I was a closet show off and I'm just an, an actual show off but all of those things get, <laughs> get pushed down a bit mm. not a bit quite a lot Definitely. so yeah you manage yeah. it and you get through mm. it but I think there needs, still mm. needs to be a lot more awareness generally um, certainly in places that that that, that are public facing banks post offices council buildings government buildings mm-hmm. etc 
I think it's yeah, important. It's important excellent. to have people with stunners on television so that you can actually see that you know, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with them. They just speak in a different mm-hmm. way to you. Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You host luncheons and networking events. Tell me more about them. Oh, right. It's mainly luncheons which have turned into networking events but I host these very um, small intimate luncheons uh, the Sylvie Hussein mm. lunch and speaker series with a, a theme each the luncheon has a theme mm-hmm. um, with a host speaker or myself and it emerges into a conversation around that theme um, and I started them mm-hmm. because when I left work when I Took, took my redundancy and re- retirement, I realised I didn't know anybody. I had very few actual friends outside of work. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's mm-hmm. what happens. That's one of the questions. Who am I without, without all of these people? <laughs> so I set these up thinking, well, there must be people like me who don't know that many people mm-hmm. newly setting up in business or... Um, you know, just newly redundant or newly retired. And it takes mm-hmm. it takes time. I don't have small children, so I'm not part of a community, a school community, or, you know, all of those things that you normally connect with. So I set up my first luncheon just just um just for that. So they're very small, they're under t- mm. maximum ten guests. Um and what happens is that there is an organic connection between these people. And it's very seldom that during during the event people bring out a business card or, or anything. They organically connect and then they mm-hmm. at the end they they you know they chat with each other and exchange details at that point. But during the lunch they are so engrossed with each other and the conversation that they're not really thinking in terms of formal networking and I didn't set it up yes. as networking right. I set it up just mm-hmm, as mm-hmm. conversation and connection I think that's for me that's mm-hmm. the important thing connection but the connection happens through conversation deep conversation absolutely and, mm-hmm. yeah and th- we're in a small group so nobody's um grandstanding or trying to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or trying it, there's nobody there that i've i've been doing them for about four 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 years now five years almost okay. i haven't met anybody who's appear who's come as a guest and is has been egocentric about about what they do or about hogging a conversation mm. or about i know i know best it's all about questions and responses and people, um, it, you know, exploring each other. And I think mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. really important. We, if, When we explore each other, we explore ourselves as well. And there have been so many insights and so much emotion in, in, in these lunches without, you know, unintentionally. That's fabulous, definitely. So what would you say is one of the most important lessons you have learnt over your career? One of the most important lessons altogether in life is that it goes on listening Mm. and Mm. listening. That's it. And not, it's come to me late in life, I have to say, not losing a sense of yourself and confidence in who you are that's very easily lost and bashed resources do you recommend daily tips steps to anyone that wants to embrace their mature self and take it on board (laughs) embrace it just literally embrace it don't judge anything Mm. don't comment on anything or you know i can't get up the way i used or i can't do this no Mm. you can't you know things things are different we 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 develop we change you know when we were two we couldn't run five miles when we're 68 we probably can run five miles but but aren't quite as supple as we as we were but it's all this is your season these are see this is a season Mm. to be embraced whatever it is um, and it could be the season of mellow fruits or it could be the springtime. It doesn't matter. Just just that word, embrace it with love mm-hmm. and with compassion. And, you know, people, there are lots of coaching cliches, I think. But, you know, just stop 
I was caught myself today going back on things that were totally embarrassing that I did, you know, years ago. And when we say forgive yourself, that's the kind of thing you need to forgive yourself. Let it mm. go. Everybody's embarrassing at some point in their lives. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Where can the listeners find you online? What's your website, Sylvie? Oh, www.sylviehussain.com. And I'm on Facebook. My, my business page is Sylvie Hussain. And you'll probably find my personal page as well under Sylvie Hussain. Okay, that's fantastic. And I'll put the links in your show notes so people can connect with you. Thank you for sharing your courageous journey with us today. And by doing so, you have helped so many others. Sylvie Hussain. Thank you very much, Anita. I've, it's been a real joy being on this show. And you've made, made the whole thing so painless and, <laughs> and encouraged, you know, encouraging. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and, yeah, um, you know, I, I hope it has helped somebody at least to embrace their, <laughs> embrace their 60s. Definitely. So my last question to you is, because we're all about Create the Courage to be Fearless podcast here, what is your definition of courage? My definition of courage for me is to keep going, step at a time, strides at a time, however, and to speak, to speak, to speak mm -hmm. up about what you believe, but to speak. It's really, for me, that's courageous. Mm -hmm.